Sister, come on in. I'm friendly. You can sit on the floor in the front. You, you know you are in this museum at a very special time because here we are in the beginning of July and you can see the carpet. You can see the carpet. Okay, well, you probably know me. I don't know personally many of you, but I will over the course of the next two days. I'm Jeff Goldstein. And um, I, I just have to say how proud we are to be addressing this group in this very special place at this very special time. And it's really hard to believe that the Student Spaceflight Experiments program started a little over two and a half, well, it was about, it was less than two and a half years ago as a sketch on the back of a napkin. And here we are doing this remarkable thing together. And all of the communities out there that aren't able to join us, I mean, they're here in spirit. There are a lot of communities that wanted to participate uh, in the conference, but the travel costs were just too, uh, too much of a, of a burden. And uh, so we're going to have a really good time on behalf of the entire community network. So uh, let me um, start off by saying that, um, and I don't know, where's, uh, where's Tim and Harry and Mike are around somewhere. Well, uh, back there. Um, Mike, this is the 21st year of the Family Science Night program. We started in 1991. And we bring in uh, parents and students and teachers from local area schools after the close of normal hours um, in winter and spring to give them a sense of the, the remarkable, uh, uh, this remarkable museum. And so let me start off by saying that um, this is the most visited museum on planet Earth. Eight to 10 million visitors a year come here. Um, what's the name of this place? Air and Space Museum? No. There are many air... Hi, Paul. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. <laughs> um, there are many Air and Space Museums. This is the National Air and Space Museum, the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. Who owns this place? You do. This is your museum. And so if 8 to 10 million visitors from all over planet Earth come here every year, there's got to be something special about this place. And so maybe the way to start off telling this story is to ask you all a question. If I had the ability to give you all the power to fly just by snapping my fingers, how many of you would do that? Raise your hands high. You, you would not. How about if it was safe? Would you do it then? I snap my fingers and you're able to fly. How many of you would do that? Why? Why would you do that? Because it's fun? because you've never done it before. And if I were to go to any nation on the face of this earth and address an audience just like this one, ask the exact same question in Japan, in Kenya, in Australia, what would they say? They'd raise their hands too. And if I could magically transport myself 2,000 years into the past and ask a group just like this one the same question, if I could snap my fingers and I'd give you the power of flight, how many would do that? What do you think they would say? They would say yes too. And so the point I'm trying to make here is that there are dreams, human dreams, that transcend space and time, that know no national boundaries, that are a thread that binds us through the ages. And this museum is a celebration of those dreams of flight and air and space. And I, I guess another way to say this in a more personal way is, uh, let me ask you a series of questions and I'm gonna give you the answer to the first question so you see how this game is played, okay? So the question is, where did you come from? And the answer is your mom and dad. Well, where did your mom and dad come from? Their mom and dad, which are your grandparents. And where did your grandparents come from? Their mom and dad, which are your great-grandparents. And how far back does this go? thousands and upon thousands of generations. You are the product of thousands upon thousands of generations. How many of you know something about your great-grandparents? Raise your hands. What about, raise your hands high. Let's see what happens here. How many of you know something about your great-great-great-great-grandparents? Great-great-great-great-grandparents, four. Raise your hands high. Hands are, have come down. How many of you know something about your great, 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 great grandparents? 10. 
two, two people in this group, which is kind of sad because we're talking about tens of thousands of human generations that gave rise to you, and you can't tell me anything about 10 generations ago. That's kind of sad that we don't know where we came from. But what's comforting is to recognize that all of those tens of thousands of generations that gave rise to you are in you now. They're in your genetic code. They're in you now. Because if they weren't in you, you would not be here. You are their legacy. And I know, I, I am certain of it, that tens of thousands of generations ago, your ancestors may have gone out on a cloudless day, a beautiful day on a grassy field, looked up into the sky and saw birds at play and asked the fundamental question, what would it be like to fly like the birds? What would it be like to have that freedom to look down on earth from above? to soar in the air, to look at a branch 200 feet up and say, I'd like to sit there and look down on Earth. What would it be like to fly like the birds? And when the sun set on that cloudless day and the stars came out, I know that your ancestors may have laid down on that grassy field, looked heavenward and said, what would it be like to go to the moon? What would it be like to go to those points of light in the sky? And every generation grabbed onto that dream, and every generation never let it go, and every generation grew frail. And when they grew frail, they reached down to the children and hoisted them up on their shoulders and said, I have gone as far as I can to keep this dream alive. It's now your turn. And be content in knowing that everything that I have learned in my lifetime, I give to you freely. All of the things that past generations have given to me, I pass on to you freely. It's your turn to take the human race where we have never been before. And every generation recognized that, that mission. Every generation added to the book of knowledge. Every generation toiled in quest of those dreams. Every generation grew frail and passed it on to the next until finally, in December of 1903, something really remarkable happened. Anybody know what happened in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, December 17th, 1903? Orville and Wilbur Wright, bicycle mechanics, took to the heavens, well, to the air, not too far off the ground, in a 12-second flight that traveled 120 feet. And if you want to get a sense of how long 120 feet is, it's the distance from this window wall to the window wall on the other side of the museum. That's it. 12-second uh, flight, 120 feet. It changed the world. We were getting around in horses and buggies at the time. And for the first time in human history, we flew like the birds. That, that dream of generations came true. We flew like the birds in a heavier-than-air vehicle that carried a human being, that had wings, uh, that control surfaces so that you could control, you could steer, you could control the direction of the vehicle, and it had an engine to keep it going for sustained flight. We flew like the birds and we were never the same again. In 1927, now let me, by the way, back up and say that I think the best way to say, uh, to describe this museum is to say that this is a sacred place where you're standing right now with regard to human dreams of flight in air and space. And the most remarkable gallery in this museum, the centerpiece of this museum, is the Milestones of Flight Gallery, which you're standing in right now. And in 2000 and, uh, in, well, it was still 2003, before December 17th, a few months before that, I believe, um, the right flyer, the first airplane that ever flew, was hanging right here. And I could have a, a, a get-together like this for a family science night program. I did. It was actually December 17, 2002, on the 99th anniversary of the first, uh, the first flight of the Wright brothers. And I asked a group just like this, where is the first airplane that ever flew? And everybody looked at me and they didn't understand, you know, where it might be. And they said, well, is it Kitty Hawk? some other museum, and a little girl sitting somewhere over here pointed up, and everybody started looking at this, this machine, and I said, is it real? And everybody said, no. 
And I said, yes, it is. This is the National Air and Space Museum. And for the 100th anniversary of Powered Flight, it was given its own gallery. That's why it's not here anymore. It's up there on the second floor when you can uh, move around the museum a little later. Go see the first airplane that ever flew. It's in a gallery called the Wright Cycle, uh, the Wright Cycle Company, right? Wright Cycle Company. And so in 1927, keeping with the stories in this gallery, Charles Lindbergh did something. Anybody know what Charles Lindbergh did? The first person all by himself to travel nonstop across the Atlantic Ocean from New York to Paris. And he did it in the spirit of St. Louis. And he was responding to a challenge. A man by the name of Ortig said, I'll give $25,000 to any person to be the first to travel across the Atlantic, New York to Paris nonstop, and many tried, but he was the first to do it. And when he came back to New York, over a million people lined Broadway and gave him a ticker tape parade. Why? It had never been done before. Where's the spirit of St. Louis, the plane that he flew? Is it real? Yes, it is. As far as I know, the only thing that, that, that was done to that plane since it came into this museum as it was dusted. And he, you know, he took off from Long Island, New York. They didn't even know if he would be able to take off carrying all of that fuel. He didn't have a parachute, he didn't have a radio, more weight, why even bother? But he came back to New York and the world was galvanized with what he did. How many of you have traveled across the Atlantic Ocean on business, on, tra on, on, on a vacation? You go across the Atlantic Ocean, you board your nearest international airport, you get into the air, and as the mighty Atlantic Ocean is moving across underneath you at about 600 miles an hour, you're doing a crossword puzzle. You're watching a movie. You're talking to a friend. You take it for granted. Why do you take it for granted? Because he was the first. And he opened up commercial aviation. What he did so galvanized the human imagination across this planet that companies raced in to try to figure out how they could make money selling commercial aviation tickets, getting airplanes, building airports, so that when you go from point A to Z the next time you board an aircraft, or when you go back home, thank him. Thank him. Now let me, let me go on and say, we were also trying to reach space with winged aircraft, to get through the upper atmosphere. And that was done uh, uh, using a vehicle called the X-15. It, it was a vehicle that traveled four, five, the first vehicle to travel four, five, and six times the speed of sound. It was dropped from the underwing of a B-52 bomber. And some of the uh, flights were so high in altitude that the pilots got astronaut wings. Where's the X-15? It's this black plane over here. All of these things are real. Now. What's interesting is that back in the 1950s, I, you, many of you weren't around at the time. I was, you know, I was just born in 1957. But you know that we were in the midst of something called the Cold War. The Soviet Union and the United States were not getting along. And the Cold War escalated into outer space in 1957, October 1957, when what happened? The, the Soviets launched Sputnik 1, and on loan from the Russian Academy of Sciences, here's a model of Sputnik 1, right here. And over here is what, uh, uh, what the answer was from the United States in 1958. This is a model of Explorer 1, and it had actually a science payload aboard uh, uh, that was overseen by a Dr. James Van Allen out of Iowa. So Iowa actually led, a, led America into space. And uh, Explorer 1 and Explorer 3, the, the science payload aboard detected radiation around Earth, and it was determined that there's a, there's a zone of radiation around Earth, which is now known as the, no, not the ozone layer, the Van Allen Radiation Belt, named for James Van Allen. But going back to Sputnik, Sputnik had a transmitter aboard that went beep, 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 and traveling around the Earth every 90 minutes, it would fly over the United States. And the United States was absolutely powerless to stop it and was absolutely stunned that the Soviets had the technological capability to do this. So the race in space was on. And the first 
human being to orbit the Earth was who? Does anybody know? Yuri Gagarin, Gagarin, he was a Soviet cosmonaut launched in 1961. Who was the first American to orbit the Earth? John Glenn. And he flew in a capsule called Friendship 7. He was up there for four hours and 55 minutes, only the second human being to see sunrise every hour and a half, to see a sunset every hour and a half. And then telemetry from Johnson Space Belt going down to Johnson Space Center indicated that his heat shield may be falling off. So they didn't even know if he was going to return, if he was going to be able to survive re-entry. Friendship 7, the sardine can that he was in for four hours and 55 minutes. John Glenn, the, the, the former senator from the great state of Ohio, is right there. That's his spacecraft. He was in that. That was orbiting the Earth. And then in 19, uh, Gemini 4 in 1965, Ed White um, was the first American to open up the hatch and conduct a spacewalk, and he was moving at 18,000 miles an hour. Okay, when you're in orbit around the Earth, you're moving at five miles a second. You just went five miles. You just went five miles. And he opened up the hatch, and he was out there at 18,000 miles an hour. The only thing holding him back, uh, holding him to his lifeboat back home, was this thin gold umbilical cord. There's Gemini 4 right there. And the hatch is open because obviously he came out of that hatch. And he, now, I, I'm, I know that, let's see, we have some SSEP researchers who are likely in fifth grade, though I don't know if any of them are here. Are, are any fifth graders here? Anybody 11 years old? No, okay, well, the reason I, there's somebody who's 11 years old? Good. Alex, and are you an SSCP researcher? Are you one of the researchers? Are you here with a, uh, as a family member? Family member. Well, the reason I tell this story is that I'm an astrophysicist, and I think that um, what's really cool from a personal vantage point in, in this place is that I had the honor of working here for eight years. And, I, you know, I know that everyone in this audience, likely everyone in this audience, will know what I'm about to say, but, but if you don't understand it, you know, ask mom and dad, but I, I think you'll understand this. There are moments in our lives that are so powerful that they stop us in our tracks, and we think about what we just saw, what we just experienced, and we are never the same again. Never. It changes us forever. There are these moments in time that do that. They could be something very personal that's only seen, you know, in your family, that you're hearing about in your family. It could be something the entire world sees. It could be something tragic. It could be something joyous. But there are those powerful moments. And I was 11 years old in July of 1969 when I saw something and it stopped me in my tracks and I knew I wanted to be a space explorer. What happened on July 20th, 1969? Moon landing. In July of 1969, three astronauts, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins, went up a gantry, an elevator, to the top of a 362-foot-high rocket. A 362-foot-high rocket is like a 36-story high building. It was a Saturn V moon rocket, and they went into a capsule at the top called the command module. It was known as Columbia. And when the systems were checked out, they got a go-ahead for launch. They launched from Florida. They went into orbit around the Earth. When the systems checked out in orbit, um, engineers at Johnson Space Center gave a go-ahead for a translunar insertion burn, and they were en route to the moon. And we were all following it back on, 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 at home on television. Is anybody, is anybody as old as me that remembers this? And what was really the most amazing thing is I, I was in Uniondale, Long Island. That's where my parents live. We were moving to the big city, New York City. And I could close my eyes and see myself sitting on these moving boxes in the living room, watching this little black and white television set. And on July 20th, 1969, I watched this, this astronaut in this bulky suit walk down this thing that didn't look like much of a ladder. And for the first time in human history, put a footprint on another world. I lived through that. I could go out at 9 o'clock Eastern time 
um, when I was watching this uh, in, in Uniondale and look up at the moon 240,000 miles away and realize that there were three people up there. And I was never the same again. And, and what's really remarkable about that story for me is that I got to work here for eight years and every morning I would walk in from the street going up to my office on the third floor past Columbia. This is it. When I, when I first got excited about space, this vehicle was 240,000 miles away. This is the real thing. It's, in, uh, it's, it's three inches under my fingertips. This took Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins to the moon and brought them safely back. I may be biased, but I think that this is the most remarkable thing the human race has ever built, ever. Because this vehicle represents us leaving Earth gravity and going to another world for the first time in history. And it happened in 1969, 66 years after the first flight by the Wright brothers. Just 66 years after this, after the Wright brothers took to the, to the sky, we landed on the moon fulfilling that other promise, that other dream of generations. And now we are living through this remarkable era again, and it's going unnoticed. There was a prize very similar to the Ortig Prize called the Ansari X Prize, which was providing $10 million to the first company, the first private organization that could launch a vehicle three times into low Earth orbit. Uh, not to low Earth orbit, to outer space. Outer space is not that far. If you think of a city 65 miles away, that city is farther than outer space. Outer space is technically just 62 miles up, 100 kilometers up. Um, but the, the Ansari X Prize is, if you get a vehicle three times in succession up to that altitude, you win the $10 million prize. And in 2004, Scaled Composites um, won the prize with space, uh, Spaceship One, their Spaceship One. And why do you think it's hanging next to the right flyer? Because Spaceship One, just like Lindbergh's flight, has galvanized the world. There are dozens of companies now racing towards commercial space flight, just like the companies were racing in the 1920s and 30s to commercial aviation. Very soon you're going to be able to go online and book a ticket to go in, on a suborbital flight out of your nearest spaceport, go into space, feel microgravity for yourselves, see the curvature of Earth, and recognize that we're all in a single solitary world together. Maybe it's worth protecting. And then orbital flights will start in a, in a number of years, in a few years, where you'll be able to book a ticket to go into orbit and have a vacation in orbit and rendezvous with a hotel in orbit. Bigelow Aerospace right now is designing hotels for orbit. Space Adventures is looking at vehicles that can take you on a sightseeing tour of the moon. Right In New York City, you go to Circle Line, you go around Manhattan. How about space adventures in a number of years where you go up and you take a circle line tour around the moon? It's coming. We're living through that right now. And the first, the first milestone in this brave new era took place on May 22nd, 2012, when the Dragon vehicle from SpaceX docked with the International Space Station for the first time, a commercial vehicle docking with ISS, and we were part of it. That's pretty cool. We, this program saw the end of the shuttle era and is seeing the dawn of this new era. And we are the first program, the first national science and technology education program that is being done on the commercial space side. So we are blazing a trail. If you take two things away from what we had this morning as a conversation, the first is that this is a history museum. And a lot of people that walk into a history museum say, history, it's ancient, it's old stuff. It's not. History is alive and well. And look, there goes another second. And there goes another. And there goes another. And you have the power to jump into history at any moment, you as an individual, and take us where we've never been before. That's what all the people that built and flew these things did. 
100,000 people built Apollo. 100,000 people built Apollo, and all of them were children once that dared to dream. I'm done.